Hey everybody, welcome on into another episode of WRL Triangle and Two. I am Luis Fernandez. He is Mark Bergen. Uh, and Mark, we are going to have a bit of a special edition of an episode combine. Uh, first time for you. Uh, for I've never been there either. Um, how how was it? Just what were your overall thoughts and impressions? First off, Indianapolis did not disappoint. The cuisine, which we'll talk about here on the back half of the show, Lewis, was absolutely terrific. And I've got to thank my guy, Ike Taylor, um, providing the opportunity to be able to go. Something I'll remember for the rest of my life. But, Lewis, let's get into it because there's a lot of ties to yeah. the triangle that I want to talk about it when it comes to the combine. First first of many trips, hopefully, Mark Bergen to the NFL combine for you. We're manifesting um, it. We're, man we're manifesting it. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with from a triangle perspective, right? The big pictures, the big talking points, oftentimes over the combine, the quarterbacks. Uh, and Drake May is the premier guy out of the triangle right now. I know a lot of people will talk about Peyton Wilson, Tez Walker, folks like that. We'll get into them in a second. But uh, let's talk about the quarterbacks first. One of the things, the whispers you hear during the combine and, and this time between NFL offseason beginning and the actual NFL draft, are players going up? Are they going down the boards? And right now, Mark Bergen, it kind of sounds like Drake May is slipping maybe from like two to, to three, but there's some movement there at the top. Yeah, and the big question was, okay, Caleb Williams is going to go number one overall. Right now, the Bears have that first overall pick. Who's the next quarterback off the board? Is it May or is it LSU's Jaden Daniels? And I was trying to glean this weekend of like, who is it going to be? Selfishly, I would have loved to see all three throw at the combine, and that did not happen. Caleb Williams, Drake May, and Daniels did not throw and did not participate in any on-field drills this weekend. So, okay, the top three picks. You've got the Commanders at number two. They have a ton of salary cap space. They have new ownership. They have new GM. Paint your picture, a blank canvas, and oh, you also have Sam Howell, Drake May's college teammate on the roster as well. I think it would ease the transition. But then New England, if it's Daniels or May, are, are the Patriots going to be satisfied and happy with whichever quarterback falls to them at number three? I think that's where this conversation starts, but there's been some chatter that May could fall out of the top three, which I don't think I'm buying quite yet, but we'll talk about it, Lewis. Yeah, I um, it, it's always you hear just a lot of like conversations, a lot of a lot of talk, if you will. Um, I think earlier when we were talking about the NFL Combine, you called it the Underwear Olympics, and and that's true. That's what it is. Um, it's a lot of people running in a straight line, doing drills like that. So, um, I'm and there's always a bit of gamesmanship when it comes to NFL draft talk, right? Sometimes people are, um, you know, trying to make a prospect maybe seem a little bit better than they are sometimes maybe they talk them down a little bit try and see what's going on there I, I don't see any way drake may falls out of the top three as long as there's no kind of like trades or anything like that but um i, I think all three of those quarterbacks are very good caleb williams drake may jane daniels they all um have uh, arm talents i would put drake may and caleb williams kind of in a different category than jaden daniels in terms of our ta arm talent um they all have the ability to create they're all none of them are perfect prospects by any means. But I think um, if you're Drake May, right, you want to go to the best situation there. Um, mm -hmm. And of those top three teams picking, which it's wild to say this, but I, I do feel like the commanders might be the best spot just because of the veteran playmakers that are there and ownership essentially starting fresh. Yeah, the salary cap space, I could maybe argue Chicago, but as long as the Bears have the top pick, that's where Williams is going. Uh, <laughs> Assuming they don't trade it again, all this is, Which is a possibility on trades. Definitely, definitely. Um, with Daniels, I think maybe your upside is higher than May. What I would say with Daniels is he's got to be more than just a one or two read guy if it's not their takeoff and run. Because at LSU this past Heisman season, he doesn't really know how to slide, Lewis. If you <laughs> pop on the tape, he does not know how to slide. Yeah. I'm serious. He, and no, no, it, 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 um, I, I think I forget. I think it was uh, Mina Kimes, maybe who I saw a tweet this, but essentially called his running style very Looney Tunes esque, where it's like he just he'll like jump and just like throw his body out there and just get absolutely decked sometimes. 
Drake may at least got better, I think, of avoiding major contact this year, but he kind of had a little bit of that in him too his, his first year. Um, yeah, it's it's I and also I like like I said, Drake May and Caleb Williams, I think they're in a league above when it comes to their arm talent, at least when compared to Jaden Daniels. Mm-hmm. I do think Jaden Daniels throws a good deep ball, but I don't know if he has necessarily like the, the zip that you need. Um yeah, so it's, I, I think it's going to kind of be like a, what are you looking for? And we'll talk about the receivers here in a second when we get to Tez Walker, but Daniels was also the beneficiary of having two stud receivers this past season at LSU. Yeah. It's not to say Drake May didn't have that with Tez Walker this past year and then Josh Downs a year ago, who's an NFL player. But to have both of those guys in Neighbors and Thomas on your team at the same time, they were big, big contributors in what was a Heisman season for him as well. Yeah. So you have to keep that in mind as well when you're evaluating these players is what's the talent like around them and what are they doing? And, you know, the argument for May would be maybe he's doing more with less. I know Marion Hampton's really talented as well from a UNC standpoint, but that's something that you have to keep in mind when you're doing these evaluations and, you know, how they play in college doesn't always project the same way to the pros. We'll see what May does at his pro day too, because like we can get enamored of a player working out in cutoffs and shorts, right? Like we saw it several years ago. I remember BYU's pro day with Zach Wilson. He's thrown across his body and everyone fell in love. He hasn't done much with the jets in the NFL Lewis. So it's not an exact science. And if it were, you'd have a better success rate than like 30 or 40% of yeah. quarterbacks hitting hitting when you draft them at any round of the NFL draft. Go ahead. The, the one thing I'll say too is I think a lot of a lot of I like just seen people talking and I think some of the more like ignorant folks in terms of Drake May are relating him to like Mitch Trubisky. No, or, no, or I've no. heard some like Zach Wilson comps and I'm like no, no so, that's just, it's it's people it's pe- people who are saying that kind of stuff I just they they never watched him play. You, the only commonality is that they both played for North Carolina with Trubisky. Yeah. Here's what I mean by that. You have two two years of starting versus Mitch's one when he was at UNC. Different coaching schemes. There was a different head coach yeah. than to say, okay, Mac Brown. And here's another thing with May too, which I credit him for. This would be a, a, a pro, a, an asset, if you will. He had a different offensive coordinator this past season than Luongo was there the year before. When he made a name for himself where it was like, whoa, who's this guy that came out of nowhere? We weren't sure what we would have at the quarterback position when Howell left North Carolina early to go to the league. So to say he's Mitch Trubisky, like you're not watching any tape and not understanding what's going on behind the scenes, particularly when it comes to there's different head coaches, totally different schemes. Anyone watching this, I want to shut that narrative down from the jump, Lewis. Yeah, all all three of these top quarterback prospects have flaws. Um, it's just going to be who you like more, really. Um, okay, let's stick with UNC offensive players, though, and go from Drake May to his wide receiver, uh, Tez Walker. Um, so Walker, I'm going to just read off his main numbers from the combine here, Mark. Um, a 4 3 6 40, pretty fast, uh, with a 1 5 4 10 yard split, um, a 40 and a half inch vert and an 11-2 broad jump. So what does all of that mean? He's athletic. That's that's really the main takeaway. That's what you learn from there. He's fast and athletic. Uh, what were your thoughts on um, what Tez Walker was able to do this weekend? Let me go with what he told reporters and then go to what I saw on the field. When he was asked, hey, describe your game in three words. Very, very fast. And what he is saying and how he performed were in sync, Lewis, because... Yeah. You read off the 40-yard dash and you go, wow, you know, that seems pretty fast. But, okay, how is that relative to the other receivers on the board? You're talking about the fourth fastest 40 time of any wide receiver that participated in this year's combine, Lewis. And then I look at, okay, the other measures of explosiveness, which is a key component of the receiver position. 40 and a half inch vertical, that was fifth best among the wide receivers. An 11 foot, two inch broad jump second among all wide receivers. So you say, Mark, you know, is this guy a football player? Is he a track and field guy? Is he going to be a future Olympian? What I saw was the fluidity getting in and out of breaks. And we saw it when he plays Miami this last year, his coming out party, and he has three touchdowns in a game. 
the fluidity. And when I talk to people in and around the league scouts, that's what they noticed is how he moves and how he's going to be able to take the top off an opposing defense. That's how he's going to make his bones. And if he played a full season, Lewis, potentially you'd be talking about a first round pick. I think a lot of people are just going to look at the stats and say, oh, these aren't that good. Remember, he missed several games because of the ineligibility issues with the NCAA. The, I think um, age will also play a little bit of a factor that with mm-hmm. that. Um, and, you know, it's I think the way people look at the draft more and more is you want to trend younger and younger and younger. Um, you want people who break out early uh, because then that kind of trends towards more production as you continue to grow into your body. Um, but no, I mean, I think Tez Walker is going to be someone who probably would be a, a second day guy. Um, if depending on what the run of receivers is like, maybe tail into the first round, but he's the, the wide receivers and the offensive linemen is specifically Loaded. offensive tackle deep this year. And the draft. deep. That's um, you're not lying. You're not lying. Lewis. So it, it's one, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, what, what is it going to look like this year versus what would it look like other years? But, mm. um, Tez Walker definitely did not hurt himself this weekend. I would put it that way. Um, no. let's go to another guy, Mark, who I think, uh, really had, Circled, got circled by a lot of people this weekend based on his performance. That's Peyton Wilson, uh, linebacker from NC State. Now, if you watched NC State at all this year, you know, if you watch ACC football at all this year, you know how good Peyton Wilson is. Um, but it's just kind of continuing to see him grow on the national side of things. Um, his numbers, I'll read them off once again, a 4-4-3, fastest 40 of all linebackers. That 10-yard split, by the way, one five four. That's the exact same 10-yard split as Tez Walker, which is interesting. That tells you there's a lot of explosion in what he does. 34 and a half inch vert and 911 broad jump. Um, so I mean, all you need to do with Peyton Wilson, I think, is turn on the tape. I mean, that's that's really all you need to know. Um, I saw them comparing him st- like statistically Luke Keekley, um, you know, future Hall of Famer, most likely out of the Carolina Panthers. You, you, you don't need to hear me talk about Luke Keekley, but um I, I think Peyton Wilson is just going to continue to, um, you know, broaden his horizons on a national perspective as we get closer and closer to the draft process. And then it just becomes, how do people value linebackers? That I think will determine ultimately where he gets picked. Definitely, Lewis. And the only word of warning I would have with Wilson is the same concern we have about Walker is that Wilson will be 24 by the time the season gets underway in the fall. Um when he ran this time, and this is when I was getting into Indy on Thursday, I wasn't surprised because I thought back to September when NC State played Notre Dame, and I was at that game at Carter-Finley Stadium in Raleigh, and Peyton Wilson had a few runs where he's chasing down Notre Dame ball carriers where NC State head coach Dave Dorn was quoted as saying, this is the fastest we've ever tracked a player going 23-plus miles per hour on a football field. He's not driving a car. Hmm. So when he ran that 4 4 4 40, I thought back to September when Dave Dorn said that following the loss to Notre Dame. That's what I thought of. And Lewis, I talked to a scout this weekend, and he told me, he goes, Mark, listen, the guys he tracked down from Notre Dame, those guys are 4 3 4 4 guys. Yeah. And you have a linebacker running that fast? Flying, Lewis. Yeah. Flying. Payton Pey- Wilson definitely helped himself this weekend. I'm um, excited to see Made himself where he some money. Do. Oh yeah. Let, let me say one. Me, let me yeah. say one other thing. A different scout I talked to about Wilson also told me this. It's not just his relentless pursuit of the football, but the angles that he takes to chase down opposing ball carriers. Yeah. He, he knows how to play and attack gaps with the right speed to have sound d- gap integrity, but to know how to blow up a play of okay, I really need to turn on the afterburners now, or okay, I can. He, he knows how to use his speed to his advantage in the start and stop of what it takes at the linebacker position and controlling the front seven. We love quarterback play. We obsess with it, but it is a line of scrimmage game, Lewis. Yeah, and, and you know, we mentioned the 4 4 3 40, right? But once again, that 10-yard split at 1-5-4, that's, that, that kind of shows you that explosion, um, that ability to attack in a gap behind the line of scrimmage things along those lines. Now, bringing up the miles per hour thing like you did is interesting. And I want to get into that because Mm -hmm. we're going to last kind of little on-field thing we're going to talk about here. Xavier Worthy breaking the 40-yard dash record. He ran a, what was it? 4-2-3. 
three, four, two, one, right? four, two, one, oh, four, two, one, excuse me. Jeez Louise. So oh, he beat the previous record held by John Ross, a Washington wide receiver four, two, two. Um, and, and so it's one of those things where like, man, just you're, you're constantly shocked how people continue to evolve. Like this is the way they, the way they run, the, how athletic they are and things like that. Uh, what was it like being there in person when that broke Mark? It was the loudest Lucas Oil Stadium was all weekend. Largest applause. And here's what you didn't see on TV that, to me, was the most incredible part. There were two aspects of this. Number one, he false started on both of his 40 attempts. So every single player participating in the combine gets two attempts. But before you start your run, you have to come to complete stillness for a full second. And the adrenaline and the nerves and, you know, you're all keyed up and ready to go. He false started on both runs. So that happens. His first run was a 4-2-5, and that drew a huge reaction initially. And it was like, wow, he's really close, and that's the fastest we've seen all weekend. Uh, Clemson's Nate Wiggins the day before was at a 4-2-8, and he was flying. So he fall starts and he decides he's going to run it again. And then when his his unofficial time was 4-2-2, the place just exploded. It was on his second attempt. You know, if you take a sample size of, say, 10 players, Lewis, eight out of the 10, probably nine out of the 10 run their faster 40 time on their first attempt, not their second attempt. And yep. he broke the record on his second attempt. It was absolutely remarkable to see. Uh, we can talk some about, okay, just because you run a fast 40 time doesn't gar guarantee success in the NFL. Again, I'll go back to scouts I talked to this weekend, though. If he goes to a situation like Andy Reid in Kansas City, Kyle I knew Shanahan you were say in it. San Francisco, if he goes to uh, a Sean McVay in Los Angeles, uh, Mike McDaniel in Miami, a brilliant offensive mind that knows how to use that speed, that's going to be the key for him is the fit because if another team that does that has an inept offensive coordinator drafts this guy, he's going to be a luxury and they're not going to use him in the right ways. But to get to see history is really special, Lewis. I um wide receivers are so cool because there are so many different ways to play wide receiver, and there are so many different body types. You've got the Puka Nakubas, the Cooper Cups, who kind of serve as almost like glorified tight ends in some ways. You've got the Tyree Kills, top-notch speed. You've got the, you know, Jamar Chases that are like, you know, the, the muscle hamsters that are just like, you know, packed and you just, they are fast, athletic, and strong. You know, you've got the, the stereotypical DeAndre Hopkins, like those, you know, classic long, tall, high-pointing wide receivers. So I think that if it's all about the fit, it's all about the system. But yes, do do wide receivers who run fast 40s necessarily translate? No, they don't. Historically, honestly, they really don't translate that well. Mm -hmm. But I think that the NFL is continuing to evolve. The game is getting smarter. Coaches are getting smarter. And so there is a way for someone to use that kind of speed for sure. Let me piggyback off that point too, Lewis, and you're spot on. Uh, Keon Coleman out of Florida State, a guy that a lot of ACC fans are familiar with. Go up and get it, guy. Basketball player makes all the circus catches you could want. Runs a four six four in the forty, and you say, "Mark, well, there are edge rushers and linemen that can run faster than that." Yeah, but when he underwent the gauntlet drill, where he's got to run the wide length of the football field, fifty three point three yards all the way across, he's flying at almost twenty miles per hour, which was it was close to twenty miles per hour, fastest you've seen. So with the ball in his hands. You see the 40 time, you say, eh, he wasn't that fast. He looked just fine to me in terms of the fluidity and the movement yep. when you actually track his miles per hour during the gauntlet drill. So don't take too much of this. It's the underwear Olympics for a reason. But it is another step in the process for these players that they're trying to establish themselves as pros. You have 320 plus get invited to the combine, 250 plus slots get drafted. So it's that opportunity. And what might be even more important to Lewis is when the players get to meet with the teams, how they comport themselves, what kind of leadership do they have? Sure. What makes them tick? What motivates them? What's their body language like? There's a lot more to it than just what the measurables are at the combine. And it was amazing to be there. But again, it's just one component in the entire evaluation of a player when it comes to the NFL draft. Absolutely. Um, and before we wrap up here, Mark, um, one of the kind of, 
I guess a lot of people when they go to the NFL combine, I've, I've never been, so I'm, I'm taking your word for it. Uh, going to places like St. Elmo's Steakhouse that's over there. Um, just tell us a little bit about the weekend and what, what it was like for you. It was an absolute delight. So I got in Thursday and I knew Friday and Saturday would be slammed. So I'm like, I'm going to St. Elmo's Steakhouse. It's an establishment. It's been there since 1902. So I get in and I have had a lot of people say, you got to try the shrimp cocktail there. It is famous, world renowned. Thankfully, I was warned that it is spicy. It is a delight to the senses. I'm not. I'm not. But when in Rome, you've got to do it. If you had any kind of sinus congestion, Lewis, Mm. you'd be cured immediately. Now, what Mm. I will say is that heat goes away almost immediately. It does not linger, but it is intense. The shrimp cocktail there was fantastic. The steak there was fantastic. It was an incredible experience at St. Elmo. So a lot of people that I've done work with over the years to get to see them not on screens, but in person was truly special. Um, Again, I want to thank Ike Taylor, had the chance to meet Reggie Wayne, had the chance to run into Jerry Rice on Saturday night. And, uh, you know, you see people in and around the league, coaches, scouts, GMs, just walking around downtown Indianapolis while you're there throughout the weekend. Uh, A lot of great media members. It is a great, great event because It brings pretty much anyone with an NFL background together in one place. And uh, like like you said off the top, I hope this is the first time of many that I get to attend the NFL Combine because it was a tremendous event. And all of the players, their families, their coaches, and the level of sacrifice that it took all of them, even just to get an invite, Lewis, to get to see that firsthand. I mean, I was sitting in the stands with – uh, mom of one of the running backs that was exercising. And when her, san- her son ran a 4-4-6 in the 40, you know, tears were streaming down her face of happiness and joy because he's getting his opportunity to showcase his ability in this league where 92 of the top 100 watch broadcasts last year in 2023 were the NFL. So it was an amazing event. I hope I get the opportunity to go back. And uh, it's been so much fun talking with you about the combine. I could probably talk about it till sundown. I, I was just thinking that we could we talk so much more about it too. How do you order your steak, Mark Bergen? You know what? In the don't, Midwestern don't me, medium. medium. No. I, yeah, yeah. It's I could do disgusting. medium rare, but listen, the uh I like the taste of medium rare, but there's uh there's a price to pay the next day with my stomach. So okay. uh, I got my steak medium, but that's funny. Listen, you gotta peel back the curtain for the listeners and the viewers of WRL Triangle and Two, Lewis. Just like just like the prospects, Mark, nobody is perfect. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, that's going to do it for us uh, for the special edition of WRL Triangle. To talk in the NFL Combine, I'm Louis Fernandez. He is Mark Bergen. Uh, please feel free to uh, give us a listen anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Five stars, like and subscribe, all of that stuff. You can watch us on 99.9 The Fans YouTube page. Make sure you give them a like as well as... Uh, subscribe to their channel. You can also watch us on WRL Sports Fan. Thank you so much. Uh, We will see you all coming up later this week when we will talk Duke and UNC Battle of the Blues Part 2.